So I used to love Sword in the Stone. It was like my favorite movie. And then I got sent home sick in first grade and I watched it and I just remember puking and I can't watch that movie anymore. Um. Ooh, probably, uh. Oh, the Grail Quest. These are the primary associations with kind of Middle English and Medieval English history and so forth. Um. I mean, I get a picture of a bunch of, like, armored dudes, probably chainmail, some helmets, some, like, royal herald. Her Heraldry. I think of late 5th century, early 6th century um, fiction. Uh, stories of great tales and valiant men and uh, great quests and loyalty and danger. Let's see. Not the, not the frog helm, but the uh the full, gosh, the full helm with the eye slits and then some sort of big plume of heraldry above. And, uh, you know, knights in, knights in colors. I think that I probably think of, um, the, the new King Arthur movie. There's one <laughs> movie that I watched when I was taking, um, Arthurian literature and film. And so that comes to mind immediately. And also the novels that I read. Well, I remember uh, some of the Knights of the Round Table, Galahad, and Merlin, of course. Um. Sir Gawain, Sir Lancelot, King Arthur, of course, Merlin. Lancelot, and Guinevere, and mm -hmm. Sir Gawain, and King Arthur, and Merlin, and... Um, Galahad, Lancelot, Arthur, Guinevere, Merlin... King Arthur, Guinevere. Uh, Lancelot, Galahad, uh, is it Tristan? Guinevere, Morgos, Morgana, Mordred, Percival, uh, Bedivere, and oh, a few others. I'm sure they're in there somewhere. I remember the Lady of the Lake. Baby of the lake, we gotta get her in there too. There was a, there was the green knight, there's the black knight. There are probably a couple other colors of knights. Black knight, which might have been his stepson or his, his illegitimate son with his half-sister that they fought in this great battle that I can't even remember the name of. And he was killed and then Arthur was really wounded and they took him to Avalon, which is a place. Um, the same, and then and then he dies, and then he but before he dies, he tries to he asks his buddy to throw the sword back into the water, and nobody wants to. The guy doesn't want to do throw Excalibur back in there, but then they finally heave it back there, and a hand reaches up. I don't know who the hand is. Once in Future King I've read, The Once in Future King, that series, I can't remember the name of the author, she wrote a trilogy of them, and The Crystal Cave was one of the titles. Monty Python! Excalibur, uh, King Arthur, Sword in the Stone at Disney, I saw the play Spam a lot, uh, Monty Python and the Search for the Holy Grail. The movie Excalibur. It's all about the sword. Mists of Avalon and the new Arthur movie. I think it was like 2004 or something. And then I have a nice little collection of recorded books from a long time ago. First, no, not first night. One with Richard Gere in it. I've seen that. In Arthur, I, I remember, again, I remember quite clearly um, the contemporary World War II um, sort of adaptation of um, um, 
the Arthurian story a little bit. And I remember uh, remember a really good long novel that was something like The Darkest Day or something. Monty Python's Search for the Holy Grail. But of course, that's that's mostly funny if you know, you know, if you had some exposure to the the stories themselves. I'd say that's a, that's a reasonable connection to draw. It's a hero figure, sacrificial figure. I believe Jesus to be real and King Arthur to be made up like a completely 100% fictional fake out. You know, there might be true elements in this is the way things were in the 5th and 6th century. My understanding is that he's not real. I don't know any correlation between... Now, I know there are like the... The, the triad of the triads, like these nine um, valiant people, I can't remember the name of them, they're the nine somethings, and one of them is King Arthur. Also Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great and Joshua and uh, Judas Maccabeus and, you know, uh, so, I mean, he's in this hall of these nine, like, amazing people or valiant people. King Arthur in Jesus? Well, I don't, I've never seen King Arthur as a Christ figure. Arthur is the hero who doesn't know his own identity. And then he goes off on this quest where he, in, in, in effect, isn't doing what he's, his job. That odd history of, uh, you know, either the uh, kind of the Rosicrucian tradition uh, or um, the lost, the ten lost tribes tradition. I don't even know if that has a particular uh, connection with the Arthurian legends, but uh, just a connection with the British Isles. It's, it's interesting, I mean, Charlemagne and Barbarossa and Arthur are all three medieval king figures, I think, who get a lot of sort of like pseudo-religious, um, or have historically gotten, I mean, obviously like the Holy Grail. Well, yeah, or Charlemagne connected. and the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, Monty Python and Dan Brown have been like my two sources of information. Mm -hmm. Oh, and and uh, and um, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. None of the King Arthur stuff I've read has been like Grail Legend King Arthur. It's been all like Excalibur and England King Arthur. Mm -hmm. Most would be through popular media, um, including you know, kind of um, the, uh, Indiana Jones version of looking for it, and then of course. Uh, Da Vinci Code, you know, that, those kinds of things. I, I haven't, uh, I mean, I've never taken it seriously as a historical question. I mean, it does sound plausible to me that something like the idea of the Holy Grail has been important to some people. Well, I'd say my, my first impression of the Grail was formed by Indiana Jones. There's an idea that it's a, a cup or a chalice, but also the idea that it's more of a metaphorical uh, goal, something to seek after. I think my understanding that the Grail tradition is based more on mythology, the Fisher King story, the stories about jo Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, the Holy Grail being the chalice that Jesus drank out of Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade. You know, when these knights were sworn to protect it, the the Holy Grail, and after all these tests, you know, Indiana Jones gets there, and there's one knight left, and he's vanquished, and then, you know, it's like choose wisely, you know, and all that, and mm -hmm. so that, you know, what, what kind of a cup would it have been, and there's like a hundred cups there, and, you know, that's all fictionalized stuff. Um, and, you know, you're supposed to have eternal or everlasting life if you drink out of the cup, but, I mean... Anything I know of the Holy Grail is completely fictionalized. My image of a knight is different from the essence of a knight. And I think the essence of a knight is uh, a, search for, a search for justice and trying to take care of the, the people around the knight. I think those are two uh, big important parts of being a knight. Of a knight, a definition of a knight is somebody who is has a certain lineage that entitles 
that person to be a knight, so it's not just a meritocracy, there are, there's a set, knight of course is supposed to have some sort of nobility, but also the knight has demonstrated his prowess through combat. I feel like the things that sort of denote a knight are the armor, the sword, the helmet, um, the like heraldry and tradition that goes along with it, um, and then sort of the code, like chivalry, honor, nobility. Um, and if you don't, if you don't have all those things, then you're not really a knight in sort of the traditional European sense. I don't know. Metaphorically, you can apply it to like pretty much anybody who stands up for something. He does valiant, suicidal, brave things, and he's not necessarily, um, in my mind, as chivalrous as we would tend to think that they would be and when we romanticize them. Because really, if you think about the 5th and 6th century, you know, we more more property than anything. So, I mean, it would be ridiculous to think that they common women would be treated the way that we even treat women today. It really makes me think about class, and like how we think about, or have how, how a lot of people have thought about class in the modern age, it seems. But I think I mostly just think of really unpleasant people who spend a lot of time preparing for and then <laughs> actually killing people, which is terrible. <laughs> night. Well, somebody who wore armor and, um, you know, personified the the chivalrous virtues and uh, served a lord in some capacity. Um, I wouldn't cast him in the friend mentor role. I'd cast him more in the role of individual who knows more than anybody else and is struggling to deal with that knowledge and so He's tempted to play God by manipulating events so that they unfold the way he thinks they're supposed to unfold. I think that Merlin, depending on who's writing the adaptation or the story, is sometimes made to look good and sometimes made to look bad. I mean, when you're going to do a cartoon about the sword and the stone, Merlin's, Merlin's going to be good. Other times, Merlin can kind of be like our conscience. You know, sometimes good, sometimes bad, depending on how we want to use Merlin. seems to represent elements of old Druidic, uh, you know, kind of uh, shaman traditions and uh, independent of kings, per se, but... Uh, could could have served in 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 the retinues of kings or in the courts of kings, perhaps. I think that as a mentor, Merlin makes a little more sense to me. The idea of Merlin and Arthur being about the same age uh, and interacting in that way doesn't always make as much sense to me. He really sort of brings out older older religious traditions and older um, older you know the wise old man kind of thing I think the thing that stands out to me about, the thing that stands out to me about Merlin the most to be honest is the little gimmick that some some versions of his story has where he ages backwards while everybody else ages forwards that was funny kind of like a Benjamin Button thing <laughs>